Uh, Susan and I, one of the things that we loved to do when we were younger, we haven't in a while yet, um, but we used to love to go on roller coasters. Uh, we loved roller coasters. And one year we went to Bush Gardens in Florida. It's pretty close to my house in Florida. And we would spend the day riding the uh, fastest, twistiest, craziest, flip you upside down rides that we could find. And, our, and then riding them again and again, because you know, you're in theme parks, so you might as well ride them a couple times. But our favorite ride was uh, Shikra, all right? And this ride was intense. It starts off just like you know, all these roller coasters do. You go up, 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 and you're going slow when you go up because you know, it's a build up. And then you turn a corner, and it's not just like a swoop you around. You turn the corner, you go up a little bit, and then they have you hang off the side of a 90 degree drop. And it actually stops the cart all the way so that everybody is at 90 degrees on the course. So you're staring down in space and you just dangle there for a couple of seconds and then it just drops. All right. And now that to me in a controlled environment is a really fun moment. <laughs> but you know that moment. That moment, that moment, they are trying to capture, roller coasters are trying to capture something in that moment. And it's that moment of just everything being completely out of your control, right? And you actually, there's, there's kind of a shot, it feels like a shot in your head. You just, your, your gut sinks and you, I'm hanging over the edge. And the, the second time that we did this roller coaster, because you can't do this one just once, right? The second time, Susan and I actually made sure we got in the front cart so that there was nothing in front of us except air and you just hang there and you, and then you drop now that moment of of dropping that's what i want to talk about this morning this morning because while i would say in a controlled environment that's a fun experience right i know that that roller coaster has been designed they they had run it for you know at least a year or two before so i knew it was fine safe and they try to make those experiences safe for for the riders because otherwise no one would ever come back right um, but we've all had a similar moment in our own lives whether a good moment or a, a more difficult moment where it feels like everything drops from underneath you and that's what the psalmist this morning is going to talk about He's going to talk about the earth giving way beneath his feet. And it's that moment, that experience that we have where it feels like time slows for a second. And it feels like things aren't quite right for a second. And it's something that roller coasters try to imitate because it's a feeling that's, that's difficult to create. Uh, and, and, in, and it can be fun and exhilarating, but it can also be completely terrifying. So this morning... Uh, we're going to continue our journey in Psalms. We only have one more after this week that we're going to do, but we're going to continue our journey in the Psalms and look at how the Lord has brought restoration to his people when the floor drops out beneath them. So if you'll turn with me this morning to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountain falls into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Now, the psalmist opens up this morning with a bold declaration. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in a time of trouble. In other words, he starts off saying, look, we can, we can trust God, which is a lot of what we've been talking about in these Psalms. I think they've been moments to say, we can trust God. And I was thinking about this actually this morning as I was thinking through my, my sermon again, that the psalmists say these things and they will repeat things again and again, in part because we're not always there. Right? That's something I, I want to talk about this morning just for a moment. We're not always there. We're not always at the place where we can say, yeah, I trust God absolutely. Uh, and so the psalmists say it, and they declare it boldly at the beginning before he even begins to talk about the troubles that he has. He says, we can trust in God. And he says it because we need to hear that. 
He says it because we don't always live in that place. We don't always live where we trust in God in the midst of all the chaos that goes on around us. And so this is his first declaration is a bold declaration. We can trust in God. He is our refuge and strength and ever present help in a time of trouble. That means any time that you are in trouble, he is there. He is there when we need him. He is there when we don't need him. He's, he, you remember last week, he's there all the time in all places. We can depend on him and he is the only sure thing in this world. And then the psalmist is saying, take hold of this truth because it's about to get crazy. So in, in verse 2, he says, therefore, we will not fear. So this is a declaration. The Lord, we can trust him. So, so for us, if, we, if I can trust the Lord, then two, I don't have to fear. I don't need to fear. The psalmist gives a conclusion here, therefore. So again, I like talking about reading things uh, in, in our Bibles. And when we read words, they're important. And sometimes we look over some words that are very important because they're little words. This one's not so little, but it's a connecting word that you kind of gloss over probably. But therefore, therefore. I had a, a professor in college who always said, uh, always ask what the therefore is there for. Always ask what the therefore is there for. Because this word therefore is telling you to look back at something. Some, we've already said something. We've said God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. That's the, the statement that we, that we stand firm on. Therefore, because of that truth, because we can trust in God, we do not need to fear. What's the therefore, therefore? So that's just a little reading tip for you. Um, apply the truth that you've already received. Apply the truth. That's what he's saying. And then he says, therefore we will not fear. Though the earth give way, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. So he's setting us up with a truth. Trust in the Lord. And he's saying, and you don't need to fear. And then he gets to why. Because sometimes the earth gives way. He says, even if the earth gives way, even if the thing that you have built all of your life around, even if the very foundation of it is thrown away, you can still trust in the Lord. That's what he's saying. What's your foundation? What's your foundation? So, of course, you know, today I'm going to talk about building on the Lord as our foundation, but this does not negate that we have other foundations in our lives. This morning, you're all sitting, I see, uh, there's ground under your feet, right? You're all sitting there, and you're, you're not afraid that you're going to suddenly fall down, uh, hopefully because this building is fairly sound. <laughs> but even if it were, if you were to drop, you'd still hit the basement, and that's built on ground, right? So you got basement and then you've got foundation under that and you've got ground under that so even this morning we have we have faith that the floor beneath us is not going to give way we are sitting here knowing that the floor will not give way what do we build our lives on what happens when the earthquakes so for the psalmist this morning he is saying look Sometimes it feels like the earth gives way beneath us. Now, we don't experience many earthquakes here in Illinois. Uh, we're not on a fault line that I know of. <laughs> um, but that is a, the terrifying moment. That moment like when you are in a roller coaster and, and the ground drops beneath you. That moment in your life when the ground drops beneath you. Something different happens and it changes things. What happens when the earth quakes and then he says, what happens when the mountains, think of the most immovable thing that you know in your life, because mountains are close to that, the most immovable thing that you know in your life, and it gets thrown into the heart of the sea. Now, for the, uh, in the Old Testament, the sea is often a picture and is often used as a metaphor for chaos and destruction. So in the creation story, in the creation event in Genesis 1, the Lord tames the waters. The chaos of, is tamed. 
right? And, the, and they often talk about, even here, uh, though the earth give way and the mountain fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, the ocean is this chaotic event in our lives. So the, the mountain, the things that we build our life around, the so solid foundations that we have, even if those are thrown into complete chaos, even if they are completely destroyed, the psalmist is saying, even if the most central thing about me is destroyed, I will still trust in the Lord. I do not need to be afraid. Now, if all is lost, I can still trust God. Now, this is, of course, a call from the psalmist in the midst of our chaos to say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need to build my life around you. Do not let the terror drag you into the chaos as well. But trust in the Lord because he is a refuge and a strength for us. He is an ever-present help. Then he turns. Psalm 46.4. You remember we talked last week about when, when tones change. So, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Then 46.4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her and she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. There is a river. Have you seen this river? There is a river. So the river, unlike the chaotic ocean, is ordered. It has a destination. It has an origin. It flows. It has banks. It has a place that it goes to. And this river, this river feeds life. So he's saying, this river, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. If the ocean is chaos, river is control. It's structured. It has boundaries. It has a destination. It is life-giving, not life-taking. It is rejoicing and restorative, not chaotic and destructive. And when we draw on this river, we will not fall. So look at verse 5. The city of God uh, God is within her, and she will not fall. Unlike the mountains, which are thrown into the ocean, the city of God, which flows next, which next to this river, it does not fall. It is not destroyed. The presence of God is there. God is within her. Unlike the ocean, which seems out of touch, God will help her. The city has the Lord as its foundation. This is how we are meant to build. We are meant to build next to this river. We are meant to build next to this river that brings peace and joy and life and, tr and we trust in it. And then the psalmist turns, he says, look, we need this river. We need this life. You need this river. You need this life. Because, verse 6, the nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The generic threat of life kind of gives way at this point to the specific threat of war. War makes us panic. What should we do? Where should we go? Who will defend us? When chaos surrounds us, because that's what he's talking about when he's talking about war. When chaos surrounds us, we must call on the name of the Lord. And then verse 7 which is the heart of this psalm and is the heart of the rest of this chapter. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, a fortress is a place, a fortified place, especially usually a military complex. It's a stronghold. It sometimes has towns attached to it. Fortresses are impenetrable, right? They're military cornerstones. They're where you defend defend your land. They are defensive centers. They are where you set up in order to keep other places safe. When I was growing up in Florida, we were quite close. Uh, my family was in Palm Coast and 30 minutes away in St. Augustine was a cool fort called Fort Matanzas. And it was built in 1742 by the Spanish uh, in order to repel British invaders, I think. And it still stands today. 
Uh, it had to be rebuilt about 100 years ago and because it was kind of beginning to fall apart. It was old rock, you know, old coquina, is what they call it. And, uh, but this fort is, is, is really neat. You go there and you can see where they set up the cannons on the wall and they've got towers so you can see to the, uh, into the ocean. Uh, and you can kind of tour around this fort and see how this was a defensive place. Now, I was interested in forts in Illinois as well, and there are a lot of forts in Illinois. I did not know this. I was thinking, oh, like, who would build a fort in Illinois? It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. There are over 150 forts, uh, camps, or posts that have been in Illinois, and it's in, as far as I could tell in its history. 150 all over the place. They're kind of mapped out all over the, all over the, all over the state. Uh, places that the Illinois that needed defense, that needed someone to uh, logistically move things through. Places where people would go in order to control land. So a fort is somewhere that we go to in order to make sure that our, our lives are safe. That we are safe. Right? So Illinois had 150 forts, camps, or posts in order to keep it safe over periods of time. And the psalmist is saying here, you have one fort. You have one fortress that you need to trust in, and that's the Lord. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So he's saying in the midst of your troubles, in the midst of your trying times, in the midst of the difficulties that you go through, your foundation can fall apart. And it will happen to some of us. Your complete foundation will fall apart. And he's saying, but the Lord is our fortress. He is somewhere we can turn to in the midst of our world falling apart, in the midst of our world being turned upside down, and we can trust in him. And the psalmist invites us to turn to the Lord in the midst of that chaos that we experience in our lives. In verses 8 through 11, he, he tells us what to do. All right, so the Lord's my fortress. What do, what do I do? What, what is, where does that leave me? So in verses 8 through 11, come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So again, what do I do? Lord, you're the fortress, so what do, what do I do? Where, where does that leave me? The first thing the psalmist says is, come and see. Well, great. <laughs> okay, well, that's not much to do. Come and see. In other words, the Lord is already at work. The Lord is already doing something. What do I need to do? Nothing. Already, he's setting us up. I don't need to do anything. I just need to come and see. Come and look at, come and observe what the Lord is already doing. Because he's already at work in your lives, right? He's already at work in my life. In the midst of that chaos, the Lord is already there. We just need to trust in him when, when we see it happening around us. This is the primary command of the section. Come and see. Observe what the Lord is doing. Who is acting? It's not us. It's the Lord. But then what does the Lord do? What, what do we see the Lord doing? And this is really interesting. Uh, we see the Lord destroying. He destroys war. He destroys the instruments of war. He destroys chaos, right? All that chaos that's going on in our lives, all that war that's happening in our lives, that's what he destroys. And, and even bigger, I, I think this applies to war, a real war, not just the metaphorical war that I'm talking about in our lives as well, but he destroys war. He destroys the, the, the things that eat up this planet. And look at this. He breaks the bows. He breaks the spears. He breaks the shields. What does that mean? Well, it means, of course, that the Lord is the one who is acting, but he's also making war cease. He is bringing his peace, and he is doing it in his way. Right? He is the one acting. He is the one who is the instrument of, of breaking things. We are powerless. 
but the Lord will, will make it come to pass. It's the Lord who we trust in. It's the Lord who's the fortress. It's the Lord who's also the offensive weapon in this story. God is the one who acts. God is the one who judge. God is the one who intercedes on our behalf. And then <clears throat> in verse 10, this is the words of the Lord to the psalmist and to us. This is the Lord speaking. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So you hear at this moment, at this key junction in the psalm, the Lord actually speaks. Maybe you have quote marks in your Bible, but this is the words, the words of the Lord to us. He's saying, in the midst of all this, you, my command to you, the Lord's command to you, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So the Lord's instruction to us, again, we're like, Lord, what do I do? One, be still. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, God, the triumphant warrior, has defeated all the enemies. And his command to us, his first command to us is be still. And the sense of this command for be still, there's a lot of ways you can say be still in Hebrew, apparently. That's, that's what I found out this week. There's a lot of ways you can say be still. This one has the idea of cease and desist. Stop what you're doing and listen. Stop what you're doing and pay attention. And I really liked this description that uh, one commentator gave, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. The illustration, it's like a parent separating two struggling children or a teacher breaking up a fight in the schoolyard. It doesn't mean to be quiet or calm as much as it means stop what you are doing and be still. Only when we cease our frantic activity can we begin to experience God's acting for us. Only then, says the psalmist, can we know that he is God. Now, one, one story that I like to tell, and Susan was laughing when I said this is the story I'm going to tell this morning. Uh, when, when I say be still, um, that's, this, is, this is a huge thing. We, a lot of us have difficulty kind of unplugging ourselves being calm, allowing the Lord to act in our lives. So here's my story. When major things happen, I end up running around like a chicken with his head cut off. So when we had um, Levi, I remember running around the house like f grabbing things, running. Uh, we had a seven-story like split-level house when we were in Thailand, and I was like running up and down like flights of stairs, running all over the place. And Susan's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm getting ready. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I'm running all over the place. I'm, I'm, I'm frantic. I mean, there's nothing short of I'm frantic. So when it came time to have Lily, uh, Susan is much smarter and much cooler under pressure than I am. Uh, she, she suspects that she, we're about to have Lily. And she goes, Patrick, why don't you go take Levi out to go get lunch? <laughs> and so Levi and I go out to go get lunch. And she begins to get ready to go to the hospital because she knows that it's coming. So instead of me running around crazy-like, um, she's like, oh, why don't you go out and grab some lunch with Levi and, you know, we'll see you in a little bit. And I'm like, well, all right. I don't know what's going on at this point. So, you know, I go out and Levi and I are kind of, you know, we're relaxing and, and we're having a good time. And we don't just eat lunch. We end up actually going for a walk. And so Susan calls me after a little bit and says, hey, you should be back here by now. Where are you? And I was like, oh, we were just chilling. She's like, oh, yeah, we need to go to the hospital, so you need to come back home. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so when I say be still, go out to eat lunch when crazy things are happening. That's the kind of be still I'm talking about. Cease and desist. Stop being frantic for a moment so we can hear what the Lord has to say to us in the midst of our time. Right? Stop being frantic for a moment so you can allow others to get your stuff together for you. Right? Stop running around like crazy so that you can enjoy the moment that the Lord has prepared for you. This psalm is directly applicable today uh, because there's so many times that we need the Lord as our, as our fortress. The second thing that he says, all right, so the first thing he says is be still. And then the second thing he says is, and know that I am God. Well, that's not a very long list of things that we have to do now, is it? <laughs> Be still.
Be still and know that I am God. In other words, acknowledge God for who he is and what he has done. Acknowledge that he, in fact, is the very foundation that we can rely on for all of our lives. Acknowledge, in fact, that the whole earth will exalt him one day, whether they want to or not. Exalting is an outflow of that. Praise comes to the Lord because of who he is. Praise comes to the Lord because what he has done in this earth. Praise to him from the nations. Praise to him from all of the nations of the earth. Now, the few things that we should take away is direct application. One, come and see that the Lord is good. We have observed his work. We should see what he is doing. In each of our lives, there is something different that is happening that he wants you to see. Come and see. That's our first directive. Come and see. Observe the works of the Lord. I'm so thankful that the Lord is at work in this church. Right? We, I think we have seen it in the last couple of weeks, in the last couple of months. The Lord is at work in this church. It's not always what we think it should be. It's not always how we would plan it out. But I know that the Lord is working here. Because people's lives are being changed, the Lord is guiding and protecting us. The Lord is being drawing himself, drawing us near to him. Come and see what the Lord is doing. Right? And continue to give testimony to what you come and see. Second, uh, we talked about this already. Be still. Disconnect yourself long enough. Stop frantically trying to fix everything in your life. Now, I can say that this morning, but this is actually one of those areas I really have trouble with. I think a lot of us do. Right? Be still. I think a lot of us have trouble trying to fix everything that is going on in our lives. I want to fix this thing that's happening with my family. I want to fix this thing that's happening with my finances. I want to fix everything. And sometimes we just have to say, Lord, I need to be still. Lord, I need to hand this over to you. Lord, I need you to speak into my life because I'm frantically trying to figure it out and I don't have the answers. And sometimes this comes, I think, in the midst of this, uh, this generation in particular. You know, we are plugged into everything. And sometimes I think being still is unplugging ourselves for a little bit so that we can hear the quiet voice of the Lord in our lives. Stopping and pausing long enough for our thoughts and our hearts and our minds and our lives to slow down, to hear the Lord. That's what be still. Stop. Cease and desist. Stop being frantically trying to do everything. Give him a little space to work, to speak. To, for you to listen. And then third, and again, this is kind of the image that the psalmist draws on repeatedly. Take refuge in the Lord. The image of God as our fortress is powerful. We will end today's service with a mighty fortress is our God. Martin Luther wrote that song based on this psalm. And it's such a mighty picture, it's such a great picture, that we can take refuge. In other words, we know that we are in trouble and we need something safe and secure and strong and that is not going to move or be shaken. That is the Lord. Draw on that metaphor in your need, in your hour of, of despair. The Lord is a great defense for us. He has huge fortifications he has cannons that blast the enemy. He has towers that see them from afar. Run to him and find your rest in what he provides. Losing the ground beneath our feet can be terrifying. It can be disorienting. <clears throat> it can be a complete upheaval of what we have always known. And this psalm speaks to those who have seen their world turned upside down. What do we do when the earth is thrown into the heart of the sea, when the ground beneath our feet gives way? The psalmist 
has taken that feeling and given us an enduring response, one that has stood the test of time because we still talk about it today. His answer is simple. Trust in the Lord as your great fortress. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He says it twice in the psalm. The Lord is our fortress. For the Lord must be our foundation. And if the Lord is your foundation, then nothing else matters. Even if the earth gives way, even if the oceans rage, even if chaos enters your life and throws it into complete turmoil, if our trust is in the Lord, nothing else matters. We do not need to be afraid. We can be still, which is difficult in chaotic times, but we can be still and allow God to work. We can take refuge in him because the Lord is our fortress, an ever-present help in a time of trouble. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your good work. Lord, we thank you that it's your work that is good. Lord, we thank you today that you have uh, brought, that you have made yourself our fortress, that you are the one who, who deals with everything around us, that your command to us, Lord, is actually stop. Stop, be still, cease and desist what you are doing so we could see what you are doing, Lord. I pray this morning that you would uh, bring us to you, that you would help us to see you as our great refuge, as our great fortress, as the one that we turn to and trust in, Lord, in the midst of our our difficulties, in the midst of our successes. Lord, would we turn to you? Would we see that you are good and that you can uh, guide us and protect us in all of our ways? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.